talk about hepatitis a little bit. You'll find hep C is probably going to be the most involved in terms of new medications here. Hep A and B are going to be a little bit more limited in terms of pharmacologic therapy that we have for that. But have you talked about hepatitis elsewhere yet? Yes. Good. Okay. So hep A. Uh, oh, which ones do we have vaccines for? A and B. A and B. Good. C. Is it is he curable? Now it is, yes. Actually, it used to not be, and I'll talk about some of the bad therapies used to have for it, but now hep C is absolutely curable, which has been a big advancement in the past couple of years or so. So anyway, starting with hep A, um, pretty self-limiting for the most part. Where do most individuals usually get it? Yeah, like food, like fecal oral spread tends to be pretty common there. Um, hep A, there was a big sort of outbreak happening in Florida, uh, at least last year. I think I'm not sure what the rates are currently, but you know, so it's certainly something that will come up. Um, typically, you're gonna find this tends to be more severe sort of in the extremes of age, and that'll be important when you're looking at who you actually wanna treat uh, in terms of the medications we have for them. So typically the very old and the very young are gonna be the most susceptible and thus may require sort of more intensive sort of therapy as we'll see in a little bit. Because for the most part, patients tend to resolve on their own and it tends to confer immunity uh, you know, after that point. So um, we will find that most patients will resolve on their own, say within six months or so. Um, a lot more though will you know just resolve on their own in, in just two. So fairly self-limited in terms of that. Um, I'm not gonna have you memorize the brand names of the vaccines. We'll talk much more about vaccines in an upcoming section a little bit later on. Um, but we'll see that and we'll talk about kind of the different types of vaccines and how immune is acquired to them and things like that. But um, we do have the ability to vaccinate individuals against that. We usually start about 12 months or so. Um, we'll talk about why we'll use certain types of vaccines at 12 months for, for children as opposed to earlier. We'll see why we do that. But um, biggest thing is just making sure to wash your hands and you know, making sure you're doing food prep sanitarily and all things like that. We do have immune globulin available. Where, anyone know where we get this immune globulin from? Actually, get from donors, right? So if people like donate plasma and things like that, they can then be spun down and separated out. So we do have immune globulin designed against Hep A. Um, however, we again will reserve that because one is pretty expensive; it's difficult to acquire, um, and so we will use that for patients, um, you know, very young, very old. In most cases, there, most adult individuals are not going to require that unless they have a really severe sort of disease from that, or unless they're immunocompromised, because again, they may not be able to kind of resolve on their own. Hep B, you'll find, is also going to be, um, for them, it can be somewhat limited in some cases here. You don't always have to treat every individual with Hep B. We'll look at a flow chart kind of to see how, how we're going to manage that. Um, but it can be uh, one of those things you see spread through like parental, you know, IV drug abusers and things like that, um, certainly through sexual transmission and whatnot. Um, but of course, we do have a vaccine against this, so a lot of people uh, tend to be uh, protected. There are risks, though, of things like perinatal transmission as well. It can be another one, another source of infection there. Uh, we do have vaccines, as I mentioned, against that here are just a few examples. Um, we can actually end up, if you have like an adult individual that was never vaccinated, we actually have one called like Twinrix that actually will protect against HBV and uh, HAV for those adults, which is kind of nice to get two for one sort of thing there. Um, you'll see that for this one in particular, there's a series of vaccines you have to get. Why do we give like multiple doses of a vaccine? What do you think? Kind of helps boost the response. So you'll find that you know with the initial exposure, you may get some degree of immunity from that, but it's not going to be very um, sort of durable. It's not going to stick around forever. So by rechallenging the individual, usually several months apart, you tend to find you get a bigger response, a bigger response, and then it sticks around for a while. And in fact, most hospitals that you go work in—I don't know if you had to do this before school or not—but you'll get uh, hepatitis B titers, the antigen or antibody titers pulled. And if it's too low, what do you do? you get a booster, right? So it'll boost you up by giving you another dose. It helps to kind of, um, you know, remind the immune system, hey, remember this stuff? Make some more antibodies against it, and that way you're, you're more protected. Because uh, again, healthcare providers will be at risk. So um, for these patients, we'll typically find that um, once they do have Hep B, we'll find that viral suppression is going to be the, the name of the game here, and we're hoping that they'll ha kind of have the zero conversion here, where basically they'll develop the antibodies, the anti- HBE antigen, and then, oh my goodness, okay. Um, I was like, is that my phone? But no, it was not. Um, so we hopefully we'll have them develop the antibodies and then they'll actually lose the antigen there, right? So that way they will show that, okay, we have suppressed it. We can't really detect it any further there. And then obviously we wanna prevent any kind of complications from the disease itself. So typically we'll find that most patients, you'll kind of do serial monitoring. You'll look at things like their LFTs, you'll look at their um, see if they zero converted or not. And then 
depending on kind of where they go in terms of their LFTs and whatnot, we'll see if we want to start treatment because we'll see that treatment can be problematic in terms of side effects and things like that. So you don't want to treat every single individ individual there. So here's an example of how you would do this. So for instance, if you had a patient, my pointer, if you had a patient here with chronic HBV and they still have the antigen present there, you can do serial monitoring for RNA level or DNA levels, just like you would for something like HIV potentially. And you can look at their LFTs. So for instance, if there are ALTs, it goes up above say two times the upper limit of normal. It's kind of like a normal upper limit for like ALT. You know, you're like in the 30s or so, but again, you always have that reference range there um, that gets published when you look at labs. But once it gets above that, you know, say you're in the hundreds, for instance, then you may decide to start treatment. If it's not, then you can just can kind of continue to observe and hopefully the body itself will just go ahead and, and be able to convert on its own, hopefully. You're going to be monitoring this as you go along, but if it does rise up too high, that's when you want to consider treatment here. So we'll look at some different options in just a little bit. Obviously, if they are you know presenting yellow from head to toe, like that's probably a good sign you want to go ahead and treat at that point, right? So one of the meds we'll use here is called interferon. Um, you'll find that overall the interferon drugs tend to be pretty nasty in terms of side effects. We don't like to give these unless we have to. And it goes to show you like, you know, you don't even start treatment until they actually show they're having some degree of, you know, transaminitis actually developing there. And so um, this is one of the older drugs we had available for this. And so basically it acts to sort of stimulate our own host immune system, kind of acts like a cytokine to kind of ramp things up a little bit. And so um, you'll find this gets used for several different disease states. You see interferon being used, it can be used for uh, different anti, as an antiviral, it can be used as an antiproliferative, certain types of cancers you may see this being used because it'll stimulate the host immune system to attack those cancerous cells. Um, and kind of consider it sort of be an immunomodulatory sort of thing there, right? So it kind of helps to ramp up that immune system. So point being is it will help to kind of stimulate our immune system to attack that hepatitis B antigens and then hopefully have that seroconversion there. Because it is a protein, obviously it will have parenteral injections associated with it. So this one requires thrice weekly injections. Thrice just means what? Uh, that's kind of weird. Seven times a week? No. Uh, three times a week. I know it's weird, but you don't ever, like, you don't say like bice weekly. We say thrice weekly. I don't know. But regardless, you're going to give these injections here. Um, we do have different forms that are available. So for instance, there's like a pegylated form here. So like if you're actually peg interferon alpha, um, that is typically done to either help out with um, efficacy purposes, or it may help out with the um, duration of action, such that you have to give yourself less injections. Um, obviously, because this is a protein, what other risks is this going to going to carry anaphylaxis is going to be a possibility as well so um, as I mentioned there's a lot of adverse effects associated with this so for instance um, you may find um, that patients especially when they have more decompensated sort of liver function here these cirrhotic patients um, you can see issues of you know things like neuropsychiatric effects and so one of the big things you'll find with this and you'll see interferon being used for hep C as well um, is it will have a lot of mood effects. It can cause patients to become pretty angry and sort of aggressive. They're just really not in a great mood. I remember talking to the wife of someone who had chronic hep C and whenever they're on interferon, they're like, they just, I just don't even want to be around them because they get so grumpy in a lot of cases there. Um, but there are risks for things like suicidality, things like that. So certainly you want to be careful if they have any sort of concomitant mental health issues for them. Um, risk for infections an issue, you can have autoimmune things start to pop up because again, you're stimulating the host immune system that maybe it'll start to attack its own cells, things like that. So not great from that standpoint, which is again, why we like to hold off and not use this as if we don't need to, right? Um, and again, we don't really know how long the optimal treatment times for, but some patients may be on this up to 24 months in some cases, which is quite a long time to get a drug like this. Uh, as you might imagine, cost is cheap, expensive. It's gonna be pretty expensive because again, it's a, it's a protein we've engineered. We have some other ones that can be used for more sort of chronic suppression. And so these are gonna be oral options that are available. So we have things like lamividine. Now, where do we see that last? So for uh, HIV. So again, there can be some crossover effects here where that can work both for the HIV virus and also for the hepatitis B virus here, which is uh, beneficial because is it possible you have patients that have both? Mm -hmm, absolutely, right? So um, other things we can use include things like uh, Hepsera or Defavir here. Um, basically, these are going to have pretty similar mechanisms in terms of helping to prevent the replication of the viral DNA, right? Because these are going to be those chain terminators, as we mentioned. And so um, these may be used depending on the 
resistance patterns because again you may find that you know compliance is really important here if you're not going to be compliant you can develop more resistant strains and so you may have to switch out the antiviral agent you're using based off of that um, this one you do want to watch out for their liver or, i'm sorry renal function because it can cause nephrotoxicity and so again monitor their their serum creatinine for that other ones we can use include things like um, entecavir. This is typically used in patients who maybe have more resistant strains. Maybe lamivudine is not gonna be a good option for them. You can end up using this. Um, in some cases, in some places, they're recommending this as first line, just mainly due to the fact that it has pretty low resistance rates to that. So that's one option there. Um, Talbivudine is another one, and then tenofovir maybe one. Um, this one is also getting a lot of use nowadays, kind of supplanting things like lamivudine, mainly due to the fact that it has pretty low resistance rates. And again, that's another one you can use for HIV as well. So you get some, some additional benefit if they have co-infection. So then switching gears to talking about Hep C. Um, for those patients, you're gonna find um, that for a long time, this was not curable. We basically were using suppression as the main mode of treatment here, but nowadays we can actually have, uh, with a new class of medications, we are able to um, basically cure the disease, which is great. And you'll find that although these initial, these new treatments are quite expensive, um, it's gonna be outweighed by the cost of things like liver transplant and things like that these patients may have required otherwise. So overall, the cost is gonna make a lot of sense, and as you'll see. But um, other issues are gonna be with this is Hep C has a lot of different subtypes and you're gonna find that will make a difference in terms of which drugs you're gonna choose. Um, and you're also gonna find that resistance may be an, an issue as well. So our hope here is gonna be to cure the patient entirely and you're gonna find that um, we want to get that sustained virologic response. So basically you want to have non-detectable HCV levels, RNA levels at least 12 weeks after the end of treatment. So they go for say a full 12, 24 weeks wait another 12 weeks after they stop treatment and then hopefully they still don't have any detectable levels. And then obviously we want to prevent progression to any kind of other liver uh, issues. So um, whereas with hepatitis B, you sort of did a watchful waiting sort of approach until they develop some degree of transaminitis, here for these patients, you're gonna to wanna to start treatment immediately. Um, Cause again, you wanna stop spread, you wanna prevent things like liver cancer and things like that from developing. So as I mentioned, um, treatment previously used to require a lot of interferon usage, which we mentioned that that has many, many side effects associated with it. There's another drug called ribavirin we'll talk about as well that were frequently used together. Um, nowadays, though, we're gonna be talking about these new uh, class of meds that are, which is additionally nice, is they're all oral regimens, so you don't have to worry about injecting the patient. Um, and they're treated for 12 to 24 weeks and then you're done, which is great, as opposed to having to be on interferon therapy for the rest of your life, potentially. Um, there are several different subtypes of hep C, as I mentioned, one through six, uh, and then subtypes within those, as you'll see, one A and one B tend to be most common in the US, but this is something you'd be testing for as well. That's important because it'll dictate which drugs you can use, and I'll show you some examples of that as we go forward. So basically what we have now, this new class is called the direct acting antivirals. And so essentially what you're gonna find here is that um, as the hepatitis C starts to produce its proteins, you're gonna find there's different ways we can affect this. So for instance, here you have viral RNA being converted into these proteins and these are actual parts of the actual, um, uh, the genome that's being coded when it's actually producing the RNA. Um, there's different places we can inhibit this, right? So either inhibiting the actual ability to have the replication of the RNA, maybe one spot we can affect this. We may be able to affect, uh, say, protein um, maturation by preventing some protease enzymes. So we'll look at some different options as we go forward. We'll talk about these different targets, things like NS5A as being a particular target here. If you can't produce new viral RNA, well, guess what? Then you can't produce new virus and then you're kind of done at that point. So um, these also have very difficult names to say, so I will not. I will not judge you if you have a hard time saying them as well, but I'll try to do my best. Uh, so Daclatisvir, like it just does not roll off the tongue very well, but Declenza does. So again, the brand names are a little bit nicer. Um, anyway, so this is gonna, and I'm actually not gonna ask you when I test, this. like a patient, you know, is tested for Hep C and they have GT1, which treatment is gonna be most effective. I'm not gonna get that granular with it um, because again, guess what I would have to do if I had a patient that was on one of these drugs? I'd have to look it up anyway, right? So I just wanna at least let you know that, hey, there are different subtypes here and they can make a difference in terms of what drugs you're gonna use, okay? I do expect you to know the mechanism, side effects, you know, the normal stuff we would cover, but um, just be aware of that. So anyway, so this is actually affecting the RNA replication and the assembly of the, the mature virus itself by binding to that NS5A protein. So it binds to that, inhibits it, basically kind of distorts the structure of the protein itself such that it can't produce the new RNA. And guess what? Now you don't have any replication of that FC anymore. Um, these are nice because 
for the most part, they don't have a ton of side effects associated with them, and they're oral agents, which is a big benefit in terms of compliance. So no adjustments for renal or hepatic insufficiencies. The side effect profile pretty minimal, and as a especially as a compared to something like interferon. However, it does carry a pretty hefty price tag, right? So typically treatment's gonna be between say 12 and 24 weeks, depending on the case there. And so again, if it's $20,000 a month, pretty hefty price tag. As opposed though, if you were to say, not treat that patient and they develop you know, liver failure and they require say liver transplant, that's gonna be much more expensive and they'd be on lifelong immunosuppressants and all that. So overall, this makes a lot of sense uh, price-wise in the, in the long run. Um, here's one where we actually have a combination of drugs here. So they have letipasvir, letipasvir, excuse me, and so fosbuvir. Again, the syllables just don't want to roll off the tongue, huh? Those S's. I know they really screw you up, but anyway. Um, so this one's pretty wide ranging in terms of its different targets here. So you kind of work on one, four, five, and six. Um, here you're going to find by using two different mechanisms, you do get some good synergy here. So the letipasvir actually it will inhibit the NS5A, similar to what we saw. Uh, on the decalatosphere. And then the sofosbuvir is actually gonna be a nucleotide prodrug that will inhibit the RNA polymerase. So it actually will inhibit the actual uh, transcription from happening there. Um, it actually will work as a chain terminator. Uh, so it, it will kind of similar to the NRTIs that we saw for HIV, it'll be able to inhibit further RNA progression, uh, production. So not only inhibiting the actual NS5A, but you get this additional benefit as well. Um, you may see this one used by itself which is again still pretty expensive. It may be used in addition, depending on resistance rates and things like that. Again, big benefit, no organ adjustments, no big side effects to really worry about. Really kind of revolutionize how we're, we're managing these patients, which is great. Uh, Semeprevir is gonna be another one here. This one is working on the protease. So this actually prevents, say you produce new proteins based off of the RNA. Um, you basically prevent the proteins from ever beginning matured. So it works on this NS34A protease. And so, Basically, you'll have another way, um, and we'll talk about different, like, based on the subtype, we'll look at different treatment options for them. Uh, but depending on the resistance rates and different resistance patterns, you may choose one of these versus the other. So I'll show you what that looks like in just a little bit. Um, again, pretty well tolerated for the most part. Um, this one, you don't want to use it by itself. You need to combine it with something else. So for instance, you may use that sofosbuvir by itself. No, I'm sorry, use that in addition to something like some Epirvir here, or potentially if you have like a really resistant um, strain of HCV, then you may end up using this along with interferon and ribavirin therapy. I'll talk about ribavirin a little bit more in just a little bit. Um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, ambitasvir is going to be another NS5A inhibitor. This one is, is again given as a combination drug with this paratepravir, which is another NS34A. So you get that protease inhibitor plus the NS5A inhibitor here. This one's um, interesting because you actually can use it with ritonavir as a booster. So again, like we saw that with a lot of the protease inhibitors back for HIV, give her a ton of you here and you can get the boost out of that. So here's that combination of Technivi here. Um, and again, you'll find different combinations that are available. Combos are just nice because they help out with compliance rates. So ribavirin I'll mention mainly because this used to be the cornerstone of therapy along with interferon, but nowadays we're using it more for say more resistant types of the HCV here. We don't really know the full mechanism for how this works. We think that in some ways it can help to lead to mutations within the viral RNA itself that kind of leads to this error catastrophe that occurs. I feel like I have an error catastrophe a lot of times. I feel like on I4 there's many error catastrophes, but basically it prevents, uh, it does enough damage to where the, the virus just says, nope, we're, we're out of here. Let's just commit apoptosis and they're done. Um, you'll also find it tends to be immunostimulatory as well. So it kind of works in conjunction with interferon to help stimulate our own immune system against the virus. And so um, this is another one that caused pretty significant neuropsychiatric effects and will typically carry black box warnings for that. So things like suicidal ideation and depression um, can be exacerbated for sure or could be you know, potentially uncovered in patients who, who uh, maybe have not been diagnosed uh, before. Other things that can come up about would be things like hemolytic anemia. So certainly you'd have to make sure you're monitoring uh, CBCs for that. You know, certainly uh, can occur pretty early on. So you wanna be very watchful for that. And then this one's gonna be pregnancy category X. Now we haven't talked too much about pregnancy categories yet. Um, we'll get more into that in the OB-GYN section coming up. Um, but do you think X sounds like a good thing or a bad thing? That sounds like a pretty bad thing. So we, you would never want to use that uh, for pregnant patients. Um, and typically they would recommend that you actually use things like two forms of birth control for those patients and even up to six months afterwards because you could still have some exposure it still have a fetus being affected by the drug even that far out. And this is another protein that would have to be injected, similar risk for anaphylaxis and whatnot. So 
Typically, you're going to use ribavirin in addition to some of the other direct acting antiviral agents um, for more difficult to treat patients. So typically, if maybe they were previously treated with interferon or ribavirin, maybe you want to include ribavirin in their new regimens here. Or if they have underlying cirrhosis, it makes it more difficult to, to treat. Um, as I mentioned, PEG interferon, is, the use has gone down substantially ever since the, the direct acting antivirals were developed, which is nice. Uh, so you should not see that being used for hep C too often. Um, and then for patients that have already developed cirrhosis from this, you're going to find that it's more difficult to get a sustained virologic response. They may require longer treatment time, so they may get up to that full 24 weeks as opposed to 12. Um, and you may have to adjust some of these depending on the degree of cirrhosis, but I'm probably not going to get that granular on the test, but just to give you an example here, you may have to adjust that. So. For treatment experience patients, as I mentioned, either longer treatment times are required or the addition of ribavirin of a table that will kind of give you an example of what that looks like in a little bit. And for those patients, you can consider doing uh, resistance testing to find out do they have any issues um, in terms of drugs they may not be a good candidates for. Um, some patients, though, with acute exposures may actually resolve on their own. About half patients will, will clear HIV within six months or so. Um, in those cases, you can decide to defer therapy if you want because it, it is a big cost for a lot of those. Um, and then compliance is the biggest thing, right? So if you have a feeling that patients are not gonna be compliant, um, you can definitely get failure of these drugs. And if you lose the ability to use those direct acting antivirals, that's not great because then we don't really have any other options for you. Um, so you wanna make sure they have some means of getting that medication every month in order to make sure that they are gonna be compliant, they're gonna finish up the regimen because they don't wanna you know, just do the one month and then that's it because that's just gonna lead to more resistance. So very important there. Um, so just to give you some examples of different types, so for instance, like 1A and 1B we mentioned is going to be used um, or seen most often in the US here, um, just to give you some examples of different combinations you can use. So if they have no cirrhosis, the liver is looking okay, you can maybe just treat for 12 weeks and be done. But you notice here, if they do have cirrhosis because it's more difficult to treat, this is where you may consider going on for 24 weeks, where you may consider giving ribavirin in addition to that to get that sustained response, right? So again, I'm not gonna ask you on a test, the patient has 1B and which where these red regimens make sense. I'm not going to ask you that, but I may ask you when would be a good case to add on ribavirin. I may ask you a case, what type of patients may require longer treatment times. And those are kind of the concept, uh, conceptual sort of things you should be able to, to pick out. So any questions for that? If not, let us continue on. I think we have ob gyn coming up next. Is that correct? All right. Uh, no questions at all. Let's continue on then. So we're getting the OB-GYN stuff. I think you start this with Professor Lack after spring break. So this will be a good little preview for you. And then you'll have my test right on, on that Monday when you come back from spring break. So you'll be very well versed in all of your hormone replacement therapies and your, your birth controls and all kinds of good stuff. Actually, I need to post that. I have a PDF that has like a big list of different types of birth controls I wanna post for you. But um, anyway, so let's talk about pregnancy and lactation first. So, uh, has anyone ever heard of thalidomide before? You may still see it used occasionally for certain types of cancers here, but um, what, what's the big deal with thalidomide? Yeah, ba basically it was kind of the first big case we saw of teratogenicity caused by medications. I'm sure there's been millions of cases before that, but this is one of the big ones that we saw. And so back in say the late fifties, we were using it as an anxiolytic for patients that were pregnant. And what they actually end up finding um, is they get this, um, this limb de deformations where they basically have these like little flippers that form instead of full actual limbs there. And so once we saw that, we realized, hey, perhaps we should not give this to pregnant patients anymore. Fortunately, we did not really get too many uses here in the US. It was mostly over in the UK where you saw most of these patients here, but it actually did lead to a lot of changes in how we handle medications. And so this is where we get the Kefauver Harris Drug Amendment. Anyone know, familiar with the FDNC Act? You know what that stands for? It's Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, right? So again, it seems weird, like food, drugs, and cosmetics, but that's under the purview of the FDA, essentially. And so they put in this amendment saying like, well, we should probably be doing, be doing testing for these medications, one, to make sure that they're actually safe for patients and that they're gonna be effective for what they're being used to treat. So that's why we have the clinical trial set up the way we do, is to make sure that these drugs, we're not gonna give someone something that's gonna potentially kill them or cause triagenicity for those patients, right? So, and again, we're gonna see more and more medication use in pregnancy go up as time goes on. More uh, patients are developing chronic illnesses that need to be managed. We're seeing that mental health disorders need to be managed during pregnancy. Um, not only that, but the typical age for pregnancy is it going up or down? 
it's going up. A lot more women are waiting longer to have uh, their, their child children. And so that means that they may have more chronic conditions that are being managed there. So because of that, you're gonna see a lot of pregnant patients who may require medication therapy. Um, and so you need to be able to, to handle that, right? And so um, you're gonna find that, at least I can speak to my own experiences, but um, does anyone familiar with mommy guilt? I mean, that's a major thing you'll see there. And so a lot of times the treatment of patients is, is difficult because you may see that you, they need like a, a prescription, they have a valid need for a medication, but they don't want to take it at all because they are worried about undue drug exposure to, to fetuses. And so this is where having good information, having resources to look at, to see like, okay, what are the potential risks that's gonna to be to your baby if you take this medication uh, can be very handy. And so it may be a conversation you have with, with your pregnant patients. So anyway, so at least 90% of women probably take some medication during pregnancy. So it's important to understand which ones may be dangerous, which ones not. But for example, there, um, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, pseudoephedrine, very common medications. And again, why are those so common? over the counter, anyone can get access to them, right? Um, we're also starting to see more and more antidepressant use as well. So we're starting to notice things like, you know, um, you know either depression, they had depression, anxiety prior to pregnancy, maybe, maybe things that are developing during the pregnancy and after need to be managed as well. So we'll talk about that a little more. So when I say teratogenesis, this is mainly just referring to any sort of significant postnatal change that occurs, say, in the, um, the offspring due to prenatal treatment. So if you take, say, for instance, valproic acid, during pregnancy, what can happen? Neural tube defects. So that's a, an example of tridogenesis, right? And in some cases, you may get these congenital anomalies, which again are going to be, um, you know, related to say the function of the child potentially. And then uh, congenital malformations are going to be these kind of structural abnormalities of prenatal origin. Um, they may interfere with either the well-being or the actual the actual viability of the fetus in and of itself. So you find that some drugs can be considered things like abortifacients, where it actually terminate the pregnancy. Anyone remember any drugs that do that? Methotrexate's a good example. What else? We talked about mesoprostol. Like things like prostaglandins can actually stimulate uh, contractions and that can lead to um, uh, abortion potentially. So and again, we'll, we'll find that obviously you can use these medications in different ways for, for different purposes here. But just to give you some examples of known teratogens, and of course this is not an all-inclusive list, but some of the things we've talked about in the past that maybe kind of will kind of stick up in your mind because we've mentioned, oh yeah, don't give that to pregnant patients. Things like ACE inhibitors, right? Things like angiotensin 1 and 2 are very important in terms of fetal development, so you want to make sure you're avoiding that. ARBs will also be on that list as well, things that are considered teratogenic. Things like androgenic hormones, really anything that affects hormones during pregnancy should probably be avoided, as you'll see in a lot of cases there. Um, certainly, cocaine can cause issues. What, how could cocaine affect a developing fetus, do you think? Yeah, a lot of vasoconstriction. Do fetuses need a lot of blood, blood supply? Absolutely, right? So if you're, you're inhibiting that, it's going to be an issue. Things like warfarin could lead to bleeding. Um, certainly, you no know, isotretinoin. Anything that affects vitamins as well. So things like vitamin A antagonists are going to certainly be avoided there. Uh, lithium, viproic acid. So a lot of these things patients may be on when they get pregnant and not even realize they've had that drug exposure. So that's, again, something you want to be cognizant of. So um, how do we determine that a drug is teratogenic? How do we figure that out? So a pregnant person takes it and then they have an effect and then that gets reported up, right? So what would you consider that? What kind of evidence? Just like a case report, right? It's just like a case study um, that you would see. So um, can you take a lot of stock in that one single case report? Not necessarily, right? Maybe that baby would have had that effect regardless of the drug exposure, right? But again, when you get multiple case reports coming up, then certainly that leads to increasing that strength of evidence to say, yeah, maybe there's something going on here. Could I just do, say, a clinical trial where I took a bunch of pregnant patients and I split them up and I give half of them placebo and the other half of medication just to see what happens? Why not? Does not sound all that too ethical, right? So we don't do that. So um, what else could we do instead? What's a good sort of surrogate for that? We could do animal testing potentially, right? So that's why you'll see certainly in pre-clinical testing, they may have information about um, so like you know mice and rats and other things that may be treated beforehand to see how that will affect them. So just because uh, a mouse has teratogenicity from exposure to a drug, does that mean humans will? Not necessarily, but sometimes there is some crossover there, right? So um, certainly we can look at the case reports, um, but other types of evidence we may use include things like case control studies, um, cohort studies. Um, again, I'm not gonna really too hard on 
study designs because again we've already passed that class and you guys have suffered enough for that although in the summertime we're going to come right back around to it when you're starting to write your your graduate project one paper so get ready to look forward to that um and again we're going to find that there's no randomized controlled trials though so that would obviously be the best way the best level of evidence but it's just not going to be available to us so as i mentioned animal studies are important here but they don't directly extrapolate over to humans there may be some crossover we just don't know in a lot of cases there so um what the pharmaceutical industry will frequently say though is they'll say hey you know the drug may have been safe for use um, in typical patients but we don't have the information about pregnancy so kind of use at your own risk there so as healthcare providers though that doesn't really help us out a whole lot we still need to know is a drug safe or not for pregnant patients there so when do you think drug exposure is sort of most important in terms of fetal development <laughs> typically the first trimester tends to be the most um, most sort of critical stage there and that's because again we're getting most of our organogenesis sort of going on at that period um, you will still find that medications may change how they affect the fetus so later on or earlier on depending on, on the process there um, so for instance you'll see that like things like insets can be used very early on in pregnancy we like to avoid them later on we'll look at why that is in terms of fetal development and things like you know, fetal circulation and whatnot but typically organogenesis that first trimester this is the most critical period where you want to have uh, little to no drug exposure or at least be able to be aware that the pregnant patient is pregnant so that way they can limit drug exposure if they need to so as i mentioned stage of pregnancy during use can be important here so for instance NSAIDs is a big example of this um, anyone know why we don't give NSAIDs to pregnant patients late in the what is it closes the ductus arteriosus right so again when they're in the womb they need that open for sufficient uh, flow however when they come out maybe want that to close off right because now they're actually breathing on their own they're circulating appropriately um what do you think we give to patients the neonates who have a patent ductus arteriosus yeah we actually give them iv insides to actually close that up that's a means of chemical uh, closure of that uh, as opposed to doing like a surgical ligation or something but um, again just to give you an example of how you know depending on the situation it, it can be beneficial or it could be harmful depending on the case there anyone know how we keep the pda open or the da open yeah we use prostaglandin so if you ever see like a neonate is born premature that's on an alprostadil drip alprostadil is a prostaglandin we, we do that pretty frequently for our patients um, so anyway, and again, the effects can range. It can be total destruction of the fetus. It could be CNS abnormalities, growth retardation, a lot of different factors here, depending on the drug, depending on the mechanism, okay? So general principles, they're gonna dictate how well drugs are gonna cross over and get exposed to the fetus um, are gonna be similar to what we've talked about previously in terms of things like CNS penetration of a medication. Because the, the, you know, the uterus itself, uh, the placenta tends to be a nice barrier against drug exposure, but some things can still cross with no problem. So things like lipid solubility matter. High lipid solubility will mean more drug crosses over and could affect that fetus, right? Um, charge on it can be important. So this is important not only for pregnancy, but also during lactation. You can actually find that depending on the pH, you can actually cause ion trapping to occur so for instance a fetal ph typically is a little bit lower than what the maternal one is and so that means if you were to say have say a weak base cross over into the placenta it may get trapped there because once in a, it's a more acidic medium it carries a charge and it has a hard time crossing back over so you can see concentration of drug in certain membranes so for instance certain substances will get trapped into the breast milk as well because of that because of the ion trapping effect which means the concentrating there the, the baby's getting more exposure to that things with lower molecular weight think you have an easier or harder time crossing an easier time smaller it's able to fit through those gaps there more easily things that are typically pretty large have a more difficult time and then protein binding can also play a role if it's trapped onto proteins circulating in the mom then they can't really cross over as easily uh, as it would be otherwise so um as you mentioned uh, there's also some additional barriers so for instance the placenta has some ability to metabolize things as well there are some enzymes there um, and that can help to limit drug exposure additionally if there was uh, anything uh, to cross over in the first place um, and you'll also find that the first place that the umbilical vein actually leads up to is guess what the fetal liver now we know that when kids are first born are there sip enzymes and all the other enzyme systems up and ready to go not typically but there still is some function so that can provide some protection as well which is kind of nice so we'll talk about pregnancy categories we are starting to move away from the category um, system a little bit in order to give you kind of more full information about 
drug exposure during pregnancy and lactation. And in fact, if you were to look up uh, a drug monograph, say for instance, you were doing um, your prescription assignment, you wanted to look up say like Zadavidine or something, you'll find that there's a specific section in all these references for pregnancy and lactation information. So we have A, B, C, D, and then X. Okay, those are the five categories you'll see most frequently referred to. Um, category A basically means that we have actual controlled studies that we've been able to do maybe in the past that have failed to demonstrate any sort of risk to the fetus, very remote harm to the fetus developing, right? So these would be things like vitamins typically fall into this category. I'll give you some more examples a little bit later on. Um, category A, generally good to go. I kind of think about this like, what would I feel comfortable giving to say if my wife were to get pregnant again? God forbid. But if she were to get pregnant, what would I feel comfortable her receiving? I love my two children, but it's all the room I got right now. No, I'm just kidding. Um, she actually asked, asked me that the other day. She said, what would happen if it, if it did happen? I said, boy, I'd, I'd probably work a lot more if I need to. Stay a lot of long days at the, at the job, I think, yeah. She didn't like that answer. But um, regardless, so category A, very safe. I would definitely give that to any pregnant patient, no problem. Category B is going to be a little less confident, but still pretty confident. I would still easily give this to a pregnant patient with really no concern for that developing fetus. Basically what B means is that we have animal studies that may have indicated risk or maybe have shown no risk, um, but we don't have any controlled studies in human patients, right? Um, so it's kind of an either or sort of thing. So if potentially we had, say, an animal study that did show some harm to the fetus, but we have nice controlled human trials that show nothing, then that's okay, that fits into a B category. So A kind of has to have both, no animal uh, injury and no and, and well-controlled human studies. The other one for B would be if maybe that we don't have enough good human studies. We have some pretty good evidence, you know, in terms of like, you know, cohort studies and, and, and case reports and things like that. But the animal studies don't show any harm. That would also fit into a category B, right? And so you may be able to ask, maybe ask this on the test to say like, okay, well, a drug has this sort of risk. What category do you think it would fit into based on the level of evidence behind it? And you should be able to kind of delineate that based on these descriptions here. So a C, anyone have like a, like a junk drawer at home? Kind of like where all the old like electronics and stuff just kind of ends up like, I'm like, where's this thing at? She's like, I'm gonna check the junk drawer. That's what category C is for, for uh, pregnancy and, and medications here. This is where basically maybe animal studies have indicated some risk, but we really don't have any adequate human information to say whether or not it's safe to use. So by default, most things end up into a category C. And in fact, the majority of drugs are gonna be considered a category C drug there. Um, D and X are gonna be a little bit more descriptive here. D is gonna be basically that we do know this causes human fetal harm. However, there may be some instances where its benefits can, may outweigh the risk to the mom. And a lot of times we think about things like, okay, well, if the mom is say so sick that she's gonna die, what happens to that fetus? It will die as well. So in some cases there may be like, well, saving the mom is gonna be the bene beneficial thing, even though we know that there could be harm to the fetus. Do we think we frequently give category D drugs? almost never and you really should try to shy away from this unless it is absolutely there's no other way to manage that we'll talk about some instances there um, for instance like uh, warfarin maybe a category d if you had a patient with like a mechanical heart valve right nowadays that has changed because now we have better direct acting um, anticoagulants but that was an example of a d back on the day and then category x is going to be there is absolutely no instances no cases where the risks or the benefits would outweigh the risk you just never give it to a pregnant patient so what's an example of a category x you would think Isotretinone's a really good one. What else? Hmm? What'd you say? Methotrexate would definitely fit that category. Uh, how about things like prostaglandins, like mesoprostol fit that, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, a lot of things will that are directly triadogenic that we know about. Valproic acid, probably would be category X, right? It's because again, we have other drugs that we could use as an anti-epileptic. We don't have to use that one potentially. So um, again, if there's known harm, the risk do not, uh, or the benefits don't outweigh the risk, it gets a category X rating there, okay? Um, you also find information regarding breastfeeding to patients. As I mentioned, similar physiochemical sort of properties apply here. So things that are more lipid soluble, smaller molecules have an easier time getting over. And I mentioned that ion trapping that can occur. There's so a certain substances will actually concentrate in the breast milk because the pH is different than what say the, uh, the serum pH would be in those cases there. So. Um, other things to consider as well, things like time since delivery can make a difference. So for instance, they have larger gaps in these alveolar mammary cells here that typically close up after about two weeks postpartum, but they are more open early on. So that's that you can have easier drug exposure happening there. And for the most part, 
the thing that is a major determinant of breast milk exposure or breast milk concentrations is going to be the maternal serum concentration. So the higher the level is in the mom, the more likely they are to have more of it into the breast milk there. And just to give you an example of the, the pH of breast milk, it can range, but as you might imagine, if it gets more acidic, that can trap weekly basic drugs and vice versa. If it were to say get more basic, it could trap weekly acidic drugs. Okay. So because of the old nomenclature didn't really provide a whole lot of benefits in terms of being very descriptive. So for instance, most drugs would come out and just be a C and I would have no idea whether or not it's, you know, the, the benefits are that way, the risk of giving it to a pregnant patient. They said, we gotta come up with something a little bit better. So for instance, we have new labeling that comes out in the package inserts for medications and a lot of the drug references you'll look at will also have the, the change over to this as well. So here you can see here, they will have just a, a general pregnancy uh, section where they'll describe sort of the clinical evidence we have behind it, either clinical trial information or maybe post-marketing uh, surveillance, things that we've seen when it's been given to patients out in the wild, we'll have lactation information, and then also we'll have this new section here that talks about male and female reproduction potential, right? So for instance, you'd have something like um, Accutane talking about how even male patients should use prophylaxis uh, in order to make sure they don't get someone pregnant because that could still have exposure to a fetus, right? Um, so things like that would be included there. So just to give you an example of what this looks like, here's uh, a little screen grab from Warfarin, for instance. And here they still give the D category uh, for women with mechanical heart valves, but it's an X for everyone else. So sometimes it can be dependent on the actual um, indication, comorbid conditions and things like that. And again, it will just go through and tell you specifically what the effects are, what we've actually seen. And so by reading this, you can have a much better idea of specifically, is this gonna be safe or not for my patient? Does it make sense to give this to them? And it will give you a lot of references and whatnot, right? Also, we'll talk about breastfeeding. Um, and so, for instance, say you know, breastfeeding women may be treated with warfarin. And based on it, we don't think warfarin crosses into the breast milk. So that's good information to have if you had someone who really needed to be on warfarin. Okay, maybe not during pregnancy. Maybe we can do something else. And then maybe while they're breastfeeding, it's okay. okay. Uh, here's an example of something that would be category B. We want Dancitron. Um, do you think this gets used often in pregnant women? Yes. Why is that? Pregnant women, pregnant women get very nauseous and they have a lot of vomiting associated with that. So yeah, so this one, um, again, we didn't do a randomized controlled trial, you know, in the preclinical testing, or I'm sorry, in the clinical trials to see, you know, if pregnant patients, you know, are gonna have good effects with this or not. But we saw that, well, a lot of it was being used regardless after it came out in the market, pregnant patients were getting prescribed it. And so we have that kind of post-marketing surveillance. We can say, okay, well, yeah, we think it's a B based on the fact that we've not really witnessed a whole lot of changes based on this, but it's good to do the reading and actually go through to see like, okay, well, what kind of changes have we seen? So for instance, they talk about things like QT prolongation, right? They talk about things like, you know, things you want to be cautious with, you know, could pregnant patients have electrolyte disturbances? Perhaps maybe that affects your QT. These are things you'd want to be watchful for, right? So, um, ultimately if you have a pregnant patient and you want to give them a medication, what should you do beforehand? look it up, right? So just look it up, double check. Even if you've done it a million times, it never hurts to recheck and see if maybe something has been updated, right? So um, let's go and do our 10 minute break now. We'll come back and we'll start talking about actual pregnancy itself. All right, uh, I did have one question up here, I think. Uh, I said my cousin just found she was pregnant. Fantastic, congratulations to your cousin. Uh, it currently takes 30 milligrams of Adderall a day. She asked me if Adderall at any dose is okay for the baby or if she needs to get off of it. I didn't know the answer, but you probably do. Guess what? I don't know the answer. It's probably not great, but we can look it up, right? Let's do it together. I feel like I watch too much like kids YouTube, like kids shows where they're like, well, we can do it together and then like, you know, a lot of call and response kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so I just pulled up Adderall in, in LexiComp here. So you can do the same thing from up to date because, you know, it's all interlinked. Uh, and so there's the whole section we just jumped to for pregnancy and lactation. Or pregnancy considerations. Here we go. Um, you can see breastfeeding considerations here as well. So typically they'll have more information that's available. So you can actually read through and see what the issues are. So what do you think would be issues in terms of just knowing what you know about the medication, what could be a risk to the fetus? Yeah, so one's putting more physiologic stress on the, on the mom, for instance, right? So it's gonna raise blood pressure and heart rate potentially to the fetus itself. What do, they, what do you think the amphetamines are gonna do in terms of cellular blood supply? may decrease if you think about it, right? It's vasoconstrictive, just like cocaine is. You can see maybe the same things here. So let's look at it. So um, 
Let's see, they have some outcome information, data collection. Da, da, da. That, that's not very useful here. Let's look at, <laughs> okay, talking about use, uh, da, da, oh, that's additional pediatric considerations. Boy, it's not really telling me a whole lot of information. That's not great. Hmm, it's probably wanting me to look at like individual. Let's look at dextro, amphetamine. Let's do that. Oops. Okay, let's look up dextro amphetamine. Now we'll go to this pregnancy. <laughs> this is really fun for you guys live, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, the majority of human data is based on illicit amphetamine, methamphetamine exposure, and not from therapeutic maternal use. They probably tell a lot of patients just to come off of it because they probably, you know, weight, uh, risk versus benefits. But use of amphetamines during pregnancy may lead to an increased risk of premature birth, low birth weight. Newborns may experience symptoms of withdrawal. That certainly is a big issue we run into. A lot of neonatal abstinence syndrome that can occur there. Behavioral problems may also occur later in childhood. Interesting. So maybe there's some downstream effects of that. Um, you know, dextroamphetamine is present in the breast milk, right? So little things like that you can look it up and so based off of that do you think you would say it's okay to use maybe not maybe you'd say okay well I'd try to consider maybe coming off of it that's what I would say if it was like a family member I was talking to um, you know and again obviously the best thing to tell them is talk to your OB guy personally talk to your talk to your primary provider about that um, yeah, but you certainly will see a lot of illicit use uh, depending on where you work. Um, you tend to see a lot more like amphetamine use, sort of more like rural sort of communities. So there's like a lot, like especially like in Putnam County where I come from, a ton of meth use out there. And so you certainly see patients who are using it, maybe against uh, better judgment, uh, maybe due to addiction purpose uh, uh, issues and you know, things like that. So I certainly would avoid it. I probably would avoid it. If I were pregnant, I would not use it. <laughs> Let's hope that never happens, right? <laughs> anyway, so good question, though. It, it, it spurs, you know, kind of that nice discussion. Yes? So, yeah, so like I said, it's starting to move away from that. So it depends on the drug. If it got a category before, um, then it will probably still be there. This will show you just for like historical purposes. But again, a lot of things are just going to be a C, which is why it's better to dig down into that specific information and see like, okay, well, what's been reported? That way you can make a better clinical decision, you know, actually based off the evidence that's presented. You can make a decision. It's nice and easy if you could just say, well, it's an X, I'm not going to use it, or it's an A, that's safe to use. Um, but as I mentioned, the majority of drugs got that C categorization and it was just useless clinically because you're like, I don't, I don't really know. What does that mean when it's a C? And that's where you have to dig a little bit deeper there. So it's good they provide that information yep okay um so continuing on so we're talking about uh, physiologic changes that occur during pregnancy and so this is for the mom herself we're not really going to be focusing so much on the fetus because again this is our ob-gyne section um so typically you're going to see all these changes can occur pretty soon on during the first trimester and they tend to peak during the second as you'll see um, blood volume is going to go up pretty significantly 30 to 40 percent because now they're pumping blood for two and you're generating more of that um, you're going to find uh, what do you think happens to the viscosity of the blood as the blood 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 volume goes up yeah it tends to uh, you actually will increase the viscosity it's going to be more harder to pump as you'll see it a little bit and that's going to be really important in terms of um, things like clots and, and whatnot as we'll see in a little bit um, you see things like gfr is going to go up you're going to see things like cardiac output will go up pretty significantly um, even though blood pressure ideally would remain constant you may see things like increases in the heart rate associated with that right <clears throat> Other issues can develop here tend to be related to things like GI motility tends to go down in a lot of cases. And as well, you'll find, especially during like second and third trimester, when um, you know, a lot of the contents of the stomach are going to be pressing up, you know, and that's going to cause a lot of like GERD symptoms and things like that. Constipation can occur here, um, leading to a lot of the nausea, vomiting you're going to see. So a lot of GI issues, and you'll see a lot of medications we're going to focus on. We'll be um, talking about how we use those in, uh, for the GI complaints. They tend to be hypercoagulable. Why do you think they're hypercoagulable? So it could be related to blood viscosity. What else? Hormones are really important, right? So which hormones specifically? <coughs> it's easy to like hormones, right? Why are they acting like that? I don't know, hormones. <coughs> so estrogen specifically will actually uh, stimulate the liver to produce more clotting factors. And so more clotting factors means more a higher propensity to, to clot off. So not only do you have this additional blood volume, you have this uh, decrease in viscosity or this increase in the viscosity of it, such as it's going to be more sludgy, sort of speaking, and then it's also hypercoagulable. So again, um, having things like PEs and DVTs in pregnancy is certainly a big concern um, that we'll look at. We'll look at some ways we can actually help to manage that. Just like, um, what's a big concern with patients who are going on oral contraceptives? Mm 
DVTs and PEs because you think about the estrogen causing a hypercoagulable state, right? So that's kind of a classic sort of presentation is like, you know, a young lady presents to the ER with chest pain. She just started birth control. Like it's a pretty classic story, right? Um, other things you're gonna find, you can change the volume distribution of drugs because maybe they have decreased albumin levels. Uh, and again, you're gonna find that there is some weight gain associated with the pregnancy such that um, that can increase volume distribution for things like fat soluble medications, right? There's more adipose tissue for the drug to distribute to. So typically in terms of drug selection, the ideal drug for a pregnant patient is no drug, but we don't live in that kind of world, right? Sometimes we're gonna to need to treat these patients here. Um, and so you need to be considerate about their acute and chronic conditions, either things that they got pregnant that they had beforehand or things that they develop while they're pregnant now. And so um, our goals would be to identify any medication exposure they're having prior to conception. But again, is that always gonna be the case? Not so much, right? So again, Surprise pregnancies happen all the time. These are things you would like to identify. So if they know that they are looking to get pregnant or they're not doing anything to pre prevent it, um, those are things you want to consider there in terms of medication use prior to conception. Um, if we can eliminate any non-essential meds, we'll do that. We'll discourage self-medication. So make sure you're giving good education on what they should and should not be using in case something comes up or at least have them call you to make sure that you know they're using something appropriately. And then try to minimize exposure to any harmful medications. If we have to use something that we know can cause harm, try to mitigate that either by reducing the dose, maybe changing the route of exposure, dosage form, et cetera. Try to help limit how much exposure that fetus is going to, to get. So there's a lot of pregnancy induced conditions we're going to be looking at. We'll talk about specifically which medications are better to use for these pregnant patients. Um, we'll talk about a lot of GI complaints here. We'll talk about uh, gestational diabetes, hypertension, all this good stuff. So in terms of treatment for acute conditions, let's talk about nausea and vomiting first, because again, this is a very common complaint. Um, you know, pregnant women also tend to have things like changes in their sensitivity to certain smells and whatnot, such that um, things that they may have enjoyed before now all of a sudden make them super nauseous. Um, it can be a pretty big, uh, pretty big deal there. Ideally, we'd like to change any dietary stuff that may be exacerbating that, you know, smaller, more frequent meals, especially later on, they get a lot of that pressure that's building up there. Um, so things we can use though, things we can use to actually treat the nausea and vomiting. Um, pyridoxine and doxylamine tend to be sort of our go-to first line meds here. Um, pyridoxine B6, how does that work as an anti-emetic? Do we ever use that as an anti-emetic anywhere else? Nope, but I don't know, they just do it and it seems to work. So um, pyridoxine is gonna be one we're gonna use. That's a category A. Like I mentioned, almost any vitamin is gonna be considered a category A because again, we're laced with it. So we should have no negative effects that we know of. And then doxylamine, what kind of drug is doxylamine? I remember. It's an antihistamine drug, right? Remember Unisom is the brain name for that one. So we oftentimes use it as an over-the-counter sleep aid for patients as a non-prescription, non-narcotic sort of product there. Um, so it's antihistamine. It will also help, it has that anti-muscarinic activity that will certainly help out with the, the nausea and vomiting there. Um, so frequently you'll see the two given together. And so there's a prescription product called Diclegis that actually puts them together. It's a delayed relief product, but it's also considerably more expensive. So frequently you can recommend just, you know, go buy over the counter Unisom, buy some B6 uh, and take them separately. And that's gonna be typically much cheaper for the patient. Just depends on what their insurance coverage and all that is. So those are both category A drugs. Those are very safe. I would have no hesitation giving it to a pregnant patient. Other thing that we've used, include things like metoclopramide and promethazine. Obviously those carry some more risk in terms of sedation, probably a little bit of stronger sedation you'll see with something like doxylamine, especially at doses we're recommending here. Um, and there's also gonna be that risk because they are D2 receptor blockers, you can have those extrapyramidal side effects those Parkinson-like effects there. So that's gonna be a risk, especially that pretty severe nausea vomiting, they're taking you know, uh, repeated doses, that's gonna be a risk for them. So those are kind of what we do, I still see a lot of doxylamine and B6 being used for those pregnant patients. Um, you can always use your, your serotonin antagonist as a backup though. So on Dantatron, it does get a fair bit of use there. So it's gonna be a category B, so we don't have as much evidence for use for those, but it seems like it's pretty safe for most patients. So I would probably recommend using doxylamine and B6 first, and then if that's not working, or maybe it's cost prohibitive, then switching over to using something like on Dantatron. That seems to be pretty reasonable for most patients. Uh, as I mentioned, we don't have any, as much data on lactation. They tend to be a little bit more expensive. So um, again, we've talked about these extensively. Are there any other risks to worry about with say like on Dancitron? Like maybe like from a cardiac standpoint? Yeah, I think about QT prolongation. You know, think about uh, they have a pre-existing cardiac history. You know, maybe something to consider there. Okay, 
Uh, with heartburn, we're going to find as well the, that we ideally would like to use medications that don't have a lot of systemic exposure, so that can be somewhat useful there to help limit uh, fetal exposure. For heartburn, typically we recommend, again, non-farm stuff like eating smaller, more frequent meals and whatnot. Um, you can use antacids. Those are perfectly reasonable. Again, you know, calcium carbonate, you know, it's a category A because, again, we have calcium carbonate in us all the time. Um, you typically want to avoid sodium-containing products. Why do you think that would be? No sodium bicarb. Why? Because all the extra sodium, what's that going to do to your blood pressure potentially? It's going to increase it, right? And you worry about things like preeclampsia. So we'll talk about pregnancy-related hypertension and ways to mitigate that. So typically, we like to avoid things like sodium bicarb, magnesium, you know, potentially that can also cause some similar effects. We want to be careful there. Um, Carifate or sucralfate tends to be pretty reasonable. Not a lot of systemic exposure. Probably at least effective out of the bunch as compared to things like your PPIs and whatnot, but it still can be used sort of intermittently for that. Um, Typically, we'll stick with like our H2 blockers because again, those are available over the counter. They're relatively cheap and they're older, so we have more evidence for use with them and not being really a big issue in terms of fetal exposure. Um, so things like ranitidine, famotidine are all fine. Which one would you never ever recommend? <laughs> Some editing, why? <laughs> not just SIP interactions, but specifically <laughs> SIP, 3A4, inhib inhib inhibition, thank you. I can't even say it. Um, but anyway, so those are fine. Um, Proton pump inhibitors are probably likely safe, but again, they've not been around as long, so we may, may not have as uh, big of a wealth of evidence to show that they are safe, um, but certainly would use that as a backup if your H2 blockers failed. In terms of constipation, we'd like to increase things like water and fiber intake. It's always going to be beneficial for those patients. Some moderate exercise is also helpful to kind of get things moving along uh, for those patients there. And for the most part, you'll stick with your bulk forming laxatives, things like your psyllium husk and metamucil and whatnot, um, mainly because they don't get absorbed and so they shouldn't have any exposure there for those patients. Um, you'll frequently see stool softeners being used, things like DocuSafe, because those tend to be fairly safe as well. Um, and for intermittent sort of acute treatment for constipation, this is where things like your osmotic laxatives can also be used. So things like Miralax can be pretty beneficial for them. Um, I'd probably recommend using something like a stool softener or a bulk forming laxative sort of for, uh, they needed something daily. That would be pretty reasonable there. Um, you know, things like uh, you know, enemas going to be for more as, uh, as needed for kind of an acute uh, sort of treatment there. Stimulants may be occasionally used, but again, what's the problem using stimulants? They kind of become physically dependent on that after a while, so you like to make sure they're only using it on an as-needed basis, not every single day. Try to avoid that. Um, interestingly, certain things you would want to avoid, things like mineral oil tends to be recommended against, even though it's you know a good like over-the-counter sort of available agent there. Um, that actually can uh, prevent certain absorption of fat-soluble vitamins like a, D, E, and K, all right, so that can also interfere with the fetus, so they definitely recommend it against that. Uh, in terms of hemorrhoids, the best way to treat hemorrhoids is don't be constipated in the first place. So if you can avoid that, it's always going to be beneficial there. And typically, we're going to use uh, topical products because, again, they're going to help to limit systemic exposure there. So things like Preparation H uh, tends to work fairly well. Um, a through G were total failures, but H works. <laughs> Just kidding, no. um, so hydrocortisone. Um, acting as a anti-inflammatory can be beneficial for this. Frequent uh, formulations also include phenylephrine. Anyone know what phenylephrine does for us? It's an alpha-1 agonist. What's a, yeah, what's a hemorrhoid? It's a dilated uh, blood vessel, so by giving a vasoconstrictor, it can help to shrink that back down. So using something like phenylephrine can be useful there. Um, which hazel is an astringent that can also help to um, decrease some of that, that swelling in those uh, additionally. And then sits bats are always uh, going to be beneficial for those patients. So. Uh, if they do develop diarrhea, this is again where bulk forming laxatives are also going to be a drug of choice because again they provide some extra bulk, kind of absorb some of that extra water, uh, and will uh, again have very limited sort of systemic exposure for the fetus. Um, loperamide has been used before. Anyone remember what loperamide does? You do know? What is it? It's the opioid, uh, for like opioid induced constipation. Or it's, or it has a similar effect as opioids, so it's constipating. Yes. Right. What does it activate? Mu receptors. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's an opioid uh, act, uh, uh, mu receptor agonist. However, do you get high off of it? Do you? Why not? Yeah, I can't cross that blood-brain barrier. So because of that, that's uh, reasonable to use. Again, it's a very old drug. It's been around forever. So again, just by the fact that pregnant women just take it, um, we have enough evidence to show it's pretty safe. Um, you know, but again, 
ideally you'd like to not need that. Stick with the bulk forming if you need to. Okay, um, so pregnancy induced hypertension. This one gets a little bit more tricky to treat these patients because you know it'd be ideal if we could just get them an ACE inhibitor, but what's the problem with that? It's tritogenic, so we can't do that. So you have to be a little bit more selective with which medications you're going to give for these patients here. Um, so again, if they have chronic hypertension, it's typically is either pre-existing or maybe they develop within the 20, first 20 weeks or so of gestation. Uh, again, how long is typical gestation? 38, 42 ish, you know, around there is pretty, pretty typical. Um, we'll see with these uh, patients that develop gestational hypertension. Again, we're classifying that as anything over uh, 140 over 90. Um, and again, this is in terms of the absence of proteinuria. And once they start to spill those proteins there, that's when we consider it sort of preeclampsia at that point. Um, what's the big risk for eclamptic patients? They develop seizures, yeah. And so, anyone know the drug of choice for that? Interesting. We'll get to that in just a moment but just you wait. Um, we'll see that as that proteinuria gets worse and worse, they're going to get more uh, severe preeclampsia at that point. Typically, this is where they may start to develop um, you know, visual symptoms. They may start to get headache associated with that, pretty severe hypertension. Um, and then actual eclampsia, here's where they develop those tonic-clonic seizures. Uh, we'll talk about how we're going to manage that because it may not be the medication you're thinking of, or you may not be thinking of any medication. It'll be a complete surprise to you, so just wait. So in terms of non-drug management, we're going to see the activity restriction is frequently recommended for these patients, but what's the drawback to having them sitting in bed all day long? Hey, we're about DVTs and venous thromboembolism just due to being more stationary, have more venous uh, blood sort of just uh, kind of sitting around. Um, if we can do things like stress reduction, because pregnancy, I mean, it's never stressful, right? No. Uh, so try to reduce stress if possible. Typically, it involves telling the husband just to shut up. It's generally <laughs> beneficial. Uh, and some mild exercise can, can also be, be helpful here. We found that calcium uh, can actually help reduce the relative risk of hypertension during pregnancy. So, um, and again, do pregnant women need calcium? They're growing an entire skeleton inside of them, so of course they could use some skeleton. Isn't that creepy to think about? Yeah, a little weird. Um, don't worry, there's other stuff on top of the skeleton when it comes out, so. Anyway. Um, so magnesium sulfate is actually the treatment of choice. So if you had a patient who developed eclampsia, they developed tonic-clonic seizures as a result of their hypertension, um, this is where we can actually use uh, magnesium. You'll never see such big doses of magnesium as you will on the labor and delivery floor. So um, typically when you think about, uh, and again, I'm not having you memorize this specifically, but you think about like a, a, a patient in torsades and you're giving them mag sulfate, anyone know what the dose you'd give is? typically two grams for an adult patient. They're giving like four to six grams at a time. And so uh, if you recall, magnesium is, uh, you know, can be vasodilatory because it acts kind of like a calcium channel blocker at the blood vessel. So it makes sense that this would help to get that pressure down. And so they're just slamming them like huge doses of IV uh, mag sulfate in order to get that pressure under control there. So, and again, in terms of safety, is magnesium safe for a fetus? Absolutely, we have, all have magnesium in us. Um, so they may get big bolses of that to get the pressure under control, and then they may actually get a continuous infusion. Um, and again, recall that um, uh, seeing hypotension, vasodilation is a common side effect of magnesium, but that's exactly what we're using it for here. Um, typically, benzodiazepines and your phenytoin should be avoided. Those are all going to be triadogenic. So the best thing is to get the pressure under control. Do you have a question? Yeah, it can have um, a little bit of an effect. It's more of the, the, the other salt components there. It's not the magnesium itself. Yeah, so, uh, but I usually don't see too much um, like mag citrate or things like that being used, but it's mainly the sodium bicarb is a big issue. But yeah, so definitely benzodiazepines are category D. Phenytoin, I believe, is a D. I'd probably just stick, avoid those. Just get the pressure under control is a big thing. So um, in terms of chronic management, so what could you do for these patients, say, before they develop eclampsia? Um, basically, we're going to see that you can stick with a couple of different drugs. The old drug of choice used to be this one called methyl dopa. Basically, it kind of works similar to something like clonidine. It actually would help to decrease sympathetic outflow. So you have less kind of norepinephrine being released from the sympathetic nervous system. That should help to drop blood pressure. Um, that one's used for a good long time. Nowadays, I'm starting to see more things like labetalol being used. So remember, labetalol is a third gen beta blocker. It's nice because it also has some additional alpha-1 antagonism. So it kind of helps with that blood pressure aspect as well. So it's getting the heart rate down, decreasing the renal angiotensin system to some small degree, and that alpha-1 blockade really does help out. So we're going to see that used quite frequently. And it's nice not only for oral management for chronically, but you can also use the IV uh, to help get that pressure under control if it, maybe the magnesium was not being sufficient on its own. Other things you'll see occasionally include things like calcium channel blockers. Typically, these are gonna be your dihydropyridines. So you may see like nifedipine, 
things like that being used. We'll talk more about how we're gonna use those a little bit later on for premature contractions. And then if you need a really rapid treatment, this is where things like nitroglycerin or nit nitroprusside could be potentially useful here. Because remember nitroprusside, um, any toxicities you can see with that? Remember, remember cyanide toxicity, right? You see that with a nipride drip. Uh, anyone remember what you give along with that to mitigate that? Sodium thiosulfate, right? You can actually combine, uh, combine the two in the same bag and use that. But um, hopefully we don't get to that point. Hopefully the labetalol uh, calcium channel blockers are going to be more, more beneficial there. Anyway, let's take management of blood pressure. Getting into how we actually help manage the, the sugars in these cases here. Now, we know that uh, pregnancy-related glucose intolerance is going to be pretty frequent in, in a lot of patients, um, which is why, as typical screening, they will do oral glucose tolerance tests, right? Anyone know what that consists of? What? Basically, they drink this really sugary, really gross tasting stuff from all accounts that does taste pretty gross. Uh, and then you can, at certain time points, you can get their sugars and determine um, how well they're able to process that increased glucose load. And so they reach certain cut points and they consider to either have impaired glucose tolerance or maybe just have gestational diabetes altogether. Um, typically, if the patient had no history of diabetes before the pregnancy and they develop it during, it'll typically go back to normal afterwards, depending on you know several other factors. But for the most part, that's what happens. Um, however, it does increase your risk for type 2 diabetes later on in life. So that's one one thing to note. So as I mentioned, we can, uh, there's a couple different ways to do it. So you can either do, so for instance, like a two-step method where you can give them, uh, you know, say 50 grams and do like a one hour glucose challenge. And then you can do a second step where you do a hundred gram challenge and then test the glucose three hours later. It's more time intensive. Um, or you may find they just do a two hour recommendation. So for instance, um, I know with my wife on her second pregnancy um, that she did the two, uh, she did the two hour one at first, but she had abnormal results and then had to go back and do the two step. And guess how much fun that was? Not fun, she's like, great, you gotta take another day to go do this and blah, 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 you know, it was just not, not, not great. So it again, depends on um, the provider and what they, they recommend there. So, and again, uh, we'll make this diagnosis based off as long as they don't have overt diabetes beforehand, right? So you're checking their A1C, you're checking their fasting glucose. Additionally, just to make sure that wasn't a, a, an issue that was already present, but has now been uncovered by the, the pregnancy. So dietary modification is the biggest uh, thing to recommend for these patients here. Um, in terms of other medications we've talked about for type two diabetes, most of them are not gonna be recommended. So no sulfonylureas, no, um, uh, you know, not usually recommended in those cases there. It's actually found that they can stimulate um, the fetus itself to release uh, insulin, which is not ideal. Um, typically insulin will just be the drug of choice for those patients there. Again, it's a pretty big molecule, so it's a hard time crossing the placenta anyway. Um, so insulin will be drug of choice usually category B, um, again, any of the insulins will be fine there. Usually like a long acting one would be pretty reasonable for the most part. Um, not ideal, because now you get the patient having to inject themselves, but it is what it is, right? So um, glybride can be occasionally used. Um, metformin may be used as well, especially if they have like pre-existing um, type two diabetes, that can still be useful as a uh, insulin sensitizer. Um, but again, tends to lack teratogenicity. Ideally though, if you can get everything off and just manage it with diet, that would be ideal. Uh, getting into thromboembolism, we see that certainly their risk goes up as estrogen stimulates the liver to produce more clotting factors that can be an issue. Um, now, warfarin is not going to be recommended here. It tends to be pretty triatogenic. as it makes sense because, uh, as I said, you don't want to mess with fat-soluble vitamins in a fetus, and warfarin affects which fat-soluble vitamin? affects vitamin K, right? So um, typically, if we have a patient who develops a DVT, PE, things like that, this is where we're going to utilize our heparins. They used to have the kind of most evidence for use. Um, down the road, you may see that the, you know, anti-10A inhibitors and our um, uh, 10A inhibitors, things like riboxaban and things like that may be taking the place. But for right now, um, we have the most history with using heparin here. So either unfractionated heparin, or you could use something like an oxaparin, a low molecular weight heparin for those patients there. Some cases they may go on prophylaxis if they're particularly high risk because they may see them using that uh, at home, injecting themselves with an oxaparin one time daily, or they may need to actually have a, a clot itself and you can actually use you know, something like a heparin drip potentially. So, And then typically you'll continue treatment if they do require it, uh, you'll continue after the pregnancy because you will find they still can have an increased risk there. So typically they'll have at least a minimum total of three months of treatment, um, but at least six weeks after that delivery because they'll still have um, pretty elevated levels of estrogen that can still cause that clot to happen again. So 
Uh, in terms of UTIs, you certainly always want to treat these even if the patient's asymptomatic. And so this is where things like um, nitrofurantoin can be pretty uh, beneficial here. It's category B, it's been used pretty safely. Um, uh, if they do have a UTI that's related to proteasote, nitrofurantoin will not cover that. So you may need something else, such as like a, a cephalosporin, right? So using like a Keflex or, or something. Most of all of these are going to be safe, no real fetal harm to, to note here. Um, and all of them can be compatible with breastfeeding. So it's kind of nice from that benefit, uh, from that standpoint. Uh, in terms of pain associated with pregnancy, we'll find that acetaminophen is typically the drug of choice. It has the most evidence for use behind it, it's all great. Um, NSAIDs, though, we don't like to use later on in pregnancy. Typically, the third trimester becomes a category D, mainly because you don't want to prematurely close the ductus arteriosus and affect fetal flow at that point. Um, but again, like I said, you can use that after they're born if you need to close it and use uh, usually IV indomethacin or IV ibuprofen is actually what we end up using there. Um, if you have to, opioids can be used, but ideally, the ideal time frame to be on an opioid is what? No time at all if you can, right? So um, certainly we've seen things like you know uh, morphine being used. Um, however, you may have patients who are chronically taking opioids throughout the pregnancy, regardless, and if they have a substance use issue. Um, and so that's when it becomes a D. So we typically will see uh, with really high doses, prolonged use, you can find some issues there. Um, what happens to the fetus that's been exposed to opioids throughout the pregnancy when they're born? Yeah, they can have that neonatal abstinence syndrome, so you can have some pretty significant withdrawal effects from that. They have a hard time regulating temperature, they vital signs are all over the place, they don't feed well, it's uh, not, not great. Anyone know what we can use to treat neonatal abstinence syndrome? Benzos potentially, um, not as commonly anymore. What else can we use? If it was due to an opioid, what can I give them instead? You can actually use uh, Narcan, would that make it worse or better? Narcan's an antagonist, that actually made the withdrawal worse. I could either use like methadone. Methadone's a common one we end up using. So you use little tiny baby doses of methadone to try to wean them off. Or in a lot of cases, we'll also use clonidine. Clonidine's really helpful. Because if you think about that withdrawal sort of picture, like they're very sort of hypersympathetic, given that clonidine helps to kind of shut and tamp that down a little bit. So it's uh, usually a two drug regimen we'll use there. If it's opioids, if it's not, then maybe you just use the clonidine potentially. Um, Okay, so getting into mental health during pregnancy, you're gonna find that um, a lot of stigma is still around mental health issues. Um, we're seeing that this is getting better as time goes on, and so we're starting to realize that uh, many pregnant women may have underlying depression, anxiety issues to treat, and so this is really important because um, unfortunately, a lot of women will want to discontinue all medications when they uh, get pregnant, but that can exacerbate a lot of these underlying issues like their depression. So uh, it's important to consider the risk versus benefits to see like, okay, well, should we continue treating or or should we try weaning off? Um, so looking at postpartum depression specifically, you know, you call them like the postpartum blues. Is this a real thing? Is it a big deal? Huge deal, yes, absolutely, right? So um, basically you're gonna find, is, especially if you imagine like just kind of the, the roller coaster of hormonal changes that occur after the pregnancy, um, that occur, it makes sense they have, you know, uh, exacerbation of underlying issues or brand new issues that are now being developed here. Um, and so you'll find this typically occurs during the first month uh, after childbirth typically. And again, as we're increasing awareness of this, uh, we can identify this easier uh, and get patients uh, more help, right? And, and now more physicians and providers are actually more likely to treat nowadays as well now that stigma is kind of going away from that so the treatment of choice for these patients is typically your SSRIs and so um, you know we know that uh, in terms of your antidepressants they're effective and tend to be pretty um, pretty efficacious pretty safe from the most part um, we do have some evidence though that there could be fetal harm related to SSRI use and so basically there is some risk including things like uh, pulmonary hypertension could be an issue that can develop there but for the most part um, the benefits do outweigh the risk in a lot of cases there so um, just to give an example, things like, you know, citalopram, escitalopram, any of these are totally fine for these patients here. Um, Proxine does carry a risk for cardiac malformations in the first trimester, so maybe avoid that one in particular. Um, what do you think happens if the mom's using an SSRI throughout pregnancy and then the baby's born? Is there any risk for withdrawal for that, that infant? Absolutely, yeah. So nice thing though, if the mom's still breastfeeding, then that becomes less of an issue because then there will be some uh, breast milk transfer and so the baby will, may not have as severe of issues. Um, however, though, may say for instance, the baby's born premature, has to go to the NICU, mom can't breastfeed potentially, that can be an issue and you can definitely see some withdrawal phenomenons uh, with those, those infants.
Okay, uh, TCAs, uh, I would probably use as a second line. Um, however, you're going to see that um, even though they're old, they have some evidence for use. We know that in general, side effect profile is much worse for the TCAs than the SSRI, so probably just use it as a backup agent if you need to. But folic acid, do pregnant women need folic acid? Absolutely. When's the ideal time to start taking folic acid if before you become pregnant? Yeah, usually it's kind of too late at that point once you're, once you're already pregnant. So um, benefit of folic acid is it does what? Prevents neural tube defects, ideally, right? So um, this is a big deal. And so uh, again, if you have patients who are looking to get pregnant, um, and again, are prenatal vitamins for just for people looking to get pregnant? No, they're good for any, anyone, right? So um, in those cases there, those will contain sufficient amounts of folic acid, but certainly recommend that they get that supplementation if they're even considering getting pregnant. It's probably not a bad idea just to get some extra anyway, because it's a water-soluble vitamin, and if you have too much folic acid, what happens to it? just peed out right so really no, no harm uh, from that standpoint um, typically we will recommend something like 400 micrograms a day it's not really that big of a dose however if they have a previous history of a neural tube defect um, at that point we actually end up giving like a four milligram dose so you kind of notice the difference there 400 micrograms versus four milligrams pretty you know hundred fold increase there in, in the dose we're giving um, a lot of patients do not follow this recommendation though and so we still end up seeing these uh, cases of things like spina bifida and, and then whatnot uh, anyone know the term tocolytic? What that means? Basically, it means it's trying to prevent contractions from occurring. And so um, we can use these to help postpone delivery. So for instance, if you have patients, um, maybe they have twins or uh, you know more than one uh, fetus. Maybe if they have um, uh, any kind of like high risk history or something, sometimes you'll administer tocolytic therapy, try to postpone the delivery if at all possible. And so one of the things we'll see we can actually use is gonna be our beta agonists can be very beneficial here. So specifically beta two agonists. And so, you know, beta two agonists, you typically think of like what drug? Oh, albuterol. albuterol, right? You typically think of albuterol, very similar to that as a, a parental and oral product called terbutaline that activates these beta-2 receptors. Now typically, why do we give albuterol to asthmatic patients? Because bronchodilation, right? You, you relax that smooth muscle. Well, we can do the same thing to the uterus because it has beta-2 receptors on it as well to actually relax those muscles and prevent the contractions from occurring. So it's something like uh, terbutaline can be useful here. Um, magnesium has maybe some some efficacy there because again it kind of works as a smooth muscle relaxant but probably not the primary thing you're going to use um, and then also see uh, a lot of calcium channel blockers being used so things like um, nifedipine which makes sense because again what is what do the dhps do to the blood vessels prevent calcium from coming in and that causes vasodilation well same thing can happen here on the uterus as well uh, so that can be uh, occasionally used that's also beneficial if they have pregnancy related hypertension that can also kind of pull double duty for those patients there so that's something you can consider um, if that was a concern uh, NSAIDs have been found to actually cause um, some relaxation of the uterine muscle but again avoid that more towards the third trimester this would be a very special use kind of case um, you, you, you know have to really weigh the risk versus benefits uh, progesterone is kind of a controversial sort of thing there. So of course we'll get into more specifics about estrogens and, and progesterones uh, in the next section of this talk here. But uh, progesterone has been used um, to help delay uh, Right, help prevent premature labor from occurring there. And so we used to have to give this kind of custom compounded product there. It was no uh, pharmaceutically available one from a drug company, but we basically give it as an IM injection at around 16 to 36 weeks, and that would help to um, hold on to the, the infant for longer. So for instance, um, and like my sister, she had uh, her first baby, uh, I believe at 30, 33 weeks or something like that. Uh, and then because she was high risk, the next time she got pregnant, and guess what? She had twins. Um, she was especially at high risk and she actually had I, I am pro uh, progesterone shots in order to help delay that as much as possible. Uh, you know what the funny thing about babies are? They tend to like like uh, work and they work very similar from pregnancy to pregnancy. So they actually had them at the exact same gestational time frame uh, as, as the first one. So kind of interesting, exactly at 33 weeks didn't really make much of a difference. So, but you'll still do it if they have a high risk for, for a preterm uh, birth there. They have a new one called hydroxyprogesterone, which is pharmaceutically available, though it's pretty expensive. So really reserved for those more high risk sort of patients there. I believe like my two girls were actually born at the exact same gestational uh, time as well. So it's kind of weird how that kind of works, but women's bodies are very strange and mystical in how they work. And we'll get into more details on that a little bit later on, but um, I still don't fully understand it, but we'll, we'll try to do it together. Um, 
So labor induction would be obviously the opposite of tocolytic therapy. Um, these are basically things that try to help uh, ripen the cervix and help to induce labor. So we'll find some things are helping to get the cervix ready um, for passage of the baby. Some things are meant more for helping with the, the actual uterus itself to contract. And so, uh, as we mentioned before, we said prostaglandins tend to be we talked about it being contraindicated in pregnancy, right? Talking about mesoprostol being a category X because it can actually be an abortifacient. Well, now we're using it for that specific purpose. We're saying, the, you know, the, the loaf of bread's ready. Let's get it out of the, out of the bakery, right? So um, my, my wife didn't like me, she's, you know, kind of likening her to a bakery either. So um, but I can say it here because I know she's never going to listen to the videos, which is great. <laughs> anyway. Um, so we have a couple different prostaglandin uh, varieties here. Dinoprostone is a, is a common one. This one's actually given vaginally. It's placed against the surface it itself. And it's just an analog of PGE2, right? So it's do doing the same thing as what we would be producing. Um, and basically, either you wait 12 hours to see if it's kind of ripened up the cervix enough for uh, to actually start labor. Um, or um, once the labor begins, then you would remove it because at that point, it's no longer needed. Um, a lot of these cases, though, it can affect fetal heart rate. So you do want to watch that. So looking for bradycardia occurring as a result of that. Um, Mesoprostol is another one you can use, as we mentioned, uh, typically given with NSAIDs to prevent NSAID-related peptic ulcers. Um, it can also be used as more of a systemic-based sort of therapy there. Other things we can give uh, include oxytocin. So what does oxytocin do for us? It's kind of like the, the love hormones, so like, you know, like you go and you know, hug your baby, like you get a big release of oxytocin, or when I hop in my car, get a, bit, a lot of oxytocin <laughs> release. You know. um, but basically, this is something that a lot of patients will get to uh, help because you'll find that the uterus will actually upregulate oxytocin receptors uh, on, on the uterus. And so we can actually take advantage of that by giving exogenous oxytocin to kind of get things moving along. So if you kind of want to um, speed up the rate of pregnancy uh, and get things moving, this is oxytocin is very beneficial here. And so uh, it'll help to facilitate those, those contractions. However, you do have to be watchful. There can be some issues, including things like PVC. So certainly cardiac monitoring is really important here. Uh, and you can see bleeding risk due to causing a fibrinogenemia, which is rare, but, but can occur. How about pain management during labor? Is this a big deal? Mm-hmm. Not, not a joke. Like this, uh, if you've never seen a baby being born, I've only seen it twice now, but it looks painful. Um, so this is where we can use our epidural uh, administration of medications here. Typically, we're going to give a combination of an opioid plus a local anesthetic, right? So why do we give it epidurally? Hmm? So it's working more locally, right? So it's kind of only working at the level of the drug itself within the spinal column. But what does it do in terms of systemic exposure? It eliminates almost. So you have very, li very limited systemic exposure. You don't have to worry about having um, opioids being used uh, systemically. So you don't have to worry as much about things like respiratory depression, either for mom or the baby. Um, so very beneficial there. Also, bupivacaine, you don't want to give that systemically because we know that can cause things like arrhythmias and seizures. But like given epidurally, it works just fine, right? And so depending, again, on the, the uh, kind of the rate that the medication is being given, depending on the positioning of the patient, it can affect how high up the, the drug is working itself, right? So that way, Basically, everything from the waist down essentially will be numbed up versus, you know, you don't want the entire body numbed up in those cases. Um, typically, you're going to find that um, hypotension, is that pruritus, and inability to avoid is going to be common, at least seen with that, not only during the pregnancy, but maybe soon after as well can be an issue. A lot of these patients when I'm getting catheterized, right? So they'll have a Foley uh, being placed because, again, they're not going to be able to really feel if they need to pee or not, and that way you can kind of catch that. Um, in some cases, that may actually prolong the first couple stages of labor. Why do you think giving an epidural could prolong that? Well, if you don't feel like you need to, to push, then that can, if you're blunting that response, then the mom may not have as much of a, a sort of impetus to do so. And so that's why, you know, getting sort of that right level of, of analgesia is important, but not to go overboard such that they don't even really feel anything and they don't really uh, push as hard. So that, that can be an issue. And then spinal headaches can be another big thing. And this has to do with the needle actually puncturing that subarachnoid space. And so that can lead to the headaches afterwards, which is um, notable. So any questions on pregnancy? Nothing at all. All right, I got some more time, right? I do. Wait, fifteen minutes. Let's keep. Let's keep going. Gonna start early anyway. So, um, so let's talk about estrogens and progestins. Um, we've seen this similarly uh, when we were talking about uh, testosterone and DHT. We, we talked about this HPA axis here. Um, typically, you're gonna find what's the main stimul uh, thing that stimulates release of LH and FSH. GnRH, good. And then once that's released, what does that do?
and then stimulate the ovaries to produce estradiol and then progesterone. A couple other ones we'll see there, but those are the two main components, right? And they will have different actions as we'll see here in just a little bit. Remember, this is a negative feedback loop such that if I were to say supply extra estrogen or progesterone, what would that do to release of things like LH and FSH? It would decrease it, right? Because again, we're causing, giving really super therapeutic doses, super uh, physiologic doses to try to shut this whole thing down. And what's the benefit of shutting the system down? Potentially you don't ovulate and potentially you can't get pregnant. That's gonna be one of the big uses we'll talk about uh, moving forward here in a little bit. So getting into the menstrual cycle itself, and again, this is a mysterious sort of thing that, you know, I'm still wowed by every time I have to teach. I'm just like, man, things are complicated. It's like with guys, it's very easy. It just goes right to the testes, produces testosterone, turns into DHT sometimes, and you're kind of done. This gets much more complicated, as we'll see. Um, so anyway, so if we're looking at uh, several things here, looking at the endometrium, kind of looking at follicular development, you get this um, covered again with Professor Lack when she starts up, up, up her section, but just kind of go through it now. Um, you're gonna find that during this menstrual cycle that they have pretty set sort of changes that occur. Typically the cycle is about how long? 28 days or so, but again, it can range depending on the patient here. And you can kind of see that during these phases here. What you'll notice is that um, typically you're going to have different surges of uh, different hormones and how that will change things like endometrial lining and, and whatnot. Um, the main goal of this whole cycle is for what? To get pregnant, right? And if you don't get pregnant, then you get your period, right? So that's basically the, the whole thing here. And so basically what we're going to find is that um, based on release of things like LH and FSH, you'll notice different surges that occur at different points. Um, you'll see that you also get surges in things like estradi estradiol, which is going to be one of the primary components we'll see. And then progesterone will also kind of bump up a little bit later. And we'll look at the different actions that it will have on things like the endometrial lining on the follicle itself. But right here, when you get day 14, this is actually the follicle will release that ova, and that's the actual ovulation period. That's when kind of like the prime time for getting pregnant occurs at that point. And that's what we're trying to prevent when we're going to be giving uh, things like our oral contraceptives. So um, disturbances in ovarian function that are quite common. You'll find a, a lot of issues here, and it could be related to medications we're giving, could be related to different disease states. Um, and so you'll find you know, it could be cancerous issues, it could be all sorts of different things causing issues here. Um, even consider things like, you know, stress uh, can help to actually shut some of this down, right? So it's more difficult to get pregnant when you're really stressed out. Think about things like extremes and diet or exercise, right? You'd always think about like, um, you know, marathon runners, female marathon runners typically get amenorrheic because again, when their body's in sort of that hyper, um, you know, stressful sort of state there, the body, does it want to get pregnant at that point? It's like, no, things are not really in a, in a good state right now. Let's wait a little bit. And so you can find lots of different disturbances because of that. So in terms of estrogens that um, females will produce, you're going to find the estradiol tends to be the main one that gets produced from the ovaries. Um, you'll also see the estrone and estriol are gonna be other ones that maybe uh, are produced due to say conversion in the liver or maybe in the periphery. These two are gonna be less um, clinically important as we'll see. Estradiol is mainly the one that we'll see being used as a replacement. This is, uh, things we may be um, seeing kind of the most clinically significant one. Interestingly enough, we can find that uh, animal products can actually be used to help supplement this. Has anyone ever heard of Premarin before? Premarin is a form of different um, estrogen conjugates, so things like equelinin and equelin. And actually what they would do is uh, collect this from pregnant mares. They actually end up taking the urine from these horses that were pregnant, they would produce high levels of estrogen, and they would be able to take it out and purify it, and then we could give that to humans. It would have very similar activity because there's enough cross reactivity, it still affected um, female estrogen receptors just like our own estradiol did. So if you ever hear primarin, this pregnant mare urine, pretty gross, right? <laughs> Nowadays we can sort of synthetically produce this, um, but again, it's always fun to talk about different animal sources for, for medications there. So we've talked about salmon, we've talked about uh, Chinese hamsters, we've talked about horses now, all kinds of stuff, right? Facts to wow your friends and, and neighbors at, uh, during, huh? Gila monsters. Yeah, Gila monsters too. I and mean, who knew their spit could be so beneficial? Leeches, talk about leeches, all kinds of good stuff. Anyway, um, so we're gonna find that uh, during the follicular and the luteal phase, which we'll talk more about in depth a little bit later on, um, you'll get some of these precursor sort of uh, hormones being produced here. And so you'll kind of go through this um, interesting dione is going to be another precursor that some of it will get converted over to testosterone. Either of these can then be affected and go through this aromatase enzyme. We've talked about aromatase before in terms of treatment for what? We talked about like breast cancer before. We'll look at some other cases for when we would want to use it. But basically aromatase will then convert this over and we'll have things like estrone or estradiol 
this is the kind of the primary one we're focusing on. We mentioned, for instance, um, you know, that what were some of the side effects of inhibiting aromatase? We just saw some masculinization in females because of the fact that you were actually um, having a higher amount of testosterone being held onto because a lot of it was not getting converted over into aromatase or into uh, estradiol by that aromatase enzyme. So this would be an important one. So these are kind of the three main components, but 17 beta estradiol is uh, the primary one we're, we're going to focus on. So we have different forms here. So we have uh, synthetic estrogens that we can produce and give to patients. Now, certainly we can give super therapeutic amounts in order to, um, say, shut down the ovulation cycle, but we can also give replacement amounts, right? So who might require, say, hormone replacement therapy? Yeah, women who've undergone menopause. So they're not producing their own estrogen and progesterone anymore. We can help to supplement that. And we'll look at some different ways we can do that in a little bit. This is where you get a lot of these synthetic estrogens coming into play. Um, and probably the most common one you run into is either ethanol estradiol. That's where you're gonna find a lot of the birth controls you'll run into are gonna include ethanol estradiol. Uh, and then you'll see a lot of conjugated estrogen products here as well. So kind of a mixture of different ones um, that you'll see being used and they'll have kind of similar activity. But again, if you look at them, all for the most part, share pretty similar sort of chemical structures with one another. So they kind of all work very similar at the actual estrogen receptor, say down in the nucleus of whatever cell you're, you're talking about. So in terms of their kinetics, this is going to be important because we'll look at things like drug interactions that can affect this. Um, typically, these will be highly protein bound for the most part. So things like albumin and this um, sex hormone binding globulin, it's another name for this, but it's alpha-2 globulin. Um, and then peripherally, you'll see the estradiol does get converted to somewhat to estro and estriol. Um, the important part here is going to be this metabolism aspect, right? So in the liver, it'll get conjugated into various metabolites and then it gets excreted in the bile, okay? After that, what happens to it? Yeah, so some of it may be eliminated in the feces, but you'll also find that that conjugation that occurs can be cleaved off by things like the bacteria in the GI tract, and that can then be reabsorbed, right? So that process of spinning things out through the bile and then being reabsorbed in the GI tract is called enterohepatic recirculation. And that's an important factor there because what does that do to the half-life of the hormones? It extends them, right? Which is why we always talk about, hey, be careful if you're using antibiotics plus or contraceptives, because if I kill off all that gut bacteria, guess what? That cleaving step never happens, and then you eliminate more of the estrogens out through the feces, and then perhaps estrogen levels drop, and then ovulation can potentially occur, right? Again, clinically, it's a good idea just to, just to be safe, but how big of an impact that has may be, may be questionable, but that's why we say that. And so anyway, so what you're going to find is, is that you'll have um, a lot of hepatic and peripheral effects due to this factor, especially when you're giving um, systemic hormones or systemic estrogens, um, which you can lead to things like cholelithiasis. You can see things like um, cholangitis and things like that developing due to the fact that a lot of it gets metabolized in the liver. And specifically, what else does it do to the clotting factors in the liver? It will stimulate production of those. And again, that's why we end up seeing a lot of risk for things like VTE in patients receiving estrogens. <coughs> So how could I get around having all the systemic exposure? Well, I could apply the drugs maybe more locally. So for instance, if I just had, uh, say, a postmenopausal patient who is having atrophic vaginitis as a result of lack of estrogen, well, what if I just applied estrogens in the vagina? There it's going to be working for much more locally. It will prevent a lot of systemic sort of effects there. And so you'll find there's ways we can get around that, either by giving um, things transdermally, via injection, or just actually intravaginally, a lot of these medications can be applied as well. So once they're actually in the system, once they actually get into the cell, whatever they're affecting, whether it be the breast tissue, endometrial tissue, wherever they're working at, um, you'll find that it will cross the membrane, get into the nucleus, and that's where it'll have its main effect. So um, changing transcription factors, upregulating or downregulating certain proteins is where your clotting factors are gonna be coming from as it kind of stimulates that process there. And again, all that's gonna be different depending on the tissue you're dealing with, right? And that's when we get into things like SERMs. You remember what SERM means? Yeah, selective estrogen receptor modulator. That's why you can find that certain drugs will actually act as an antagonist, <clears throat> antagonist in the breast tissue, but an agonist in other tissue, right? So say like in the bones, for instance. And so we'll see, uh, but in this case here, the estrogens kind of work as agonists everywhere. So um, I think I'm gonna cut it off here. I'm sure you guys won't mind that. Um, any questions so far? We'll get into the mechanism a little bit more as we come back next time. Uh, let us see if there's any questions. Okay.
Uh, if we're placing a pregnant patient on bed rest, they're preclamped or at risk, should we automatically provide prophylaxis for DVTs? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know if every patient will get that. Certainly, you consider things like, you know, are they overweight? Do they have a history? Um, so I don't know the full recommendations. Anyone know where you go to find those recommendations? ACOG guidelines, so the American College of Gynecology, that's where you want to go check for your guidelines for that stuff. Or look up up to date, they'll include those guidelines on there. That's always going to be your main resource for pregnant patients. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions? If not, I will see you all next time.